Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's also special morning edition of That Tom Clancy Show. I am, of course, your host, Mr. That Tom Clancy. Uh, it is a lovely Thursday morning. If any of you all follow me on Twitter, and I don't see why you wouldn't, at Tom Clancy, remember the H, it's very important. Uh, Mr. Chris Evans, Captain America himself, sent a lovely message to a young boy who saved his daughter, or not his daughter, his little sister from a dog attack. Uh, truly, Chris Evans is too excellent. We don't deserve him. So, but we're not here to talk about Chris Evans. But if we were, that would be great because it would mean that he's the guest and that's never going to happen. Um, so, instead, my guest equally great, uh, is the bronze medalist from last month's Pitcher Game Awards. Uh, he's the mind behind a game about the imperfect tool that is language. Bits and Pixels, uh, Gerben Grave. Let me, camera, woo! Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Nice. I'm glad Thanks somebody is. Me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I love being here. I made this place. It's my place. It's my own. But it's nice. You know, it's it's not bad. It's humble. Uh, the uh, there's nothing out beyond the cameras, though. So that's yeah. that's that's not a by design darkness. It's there's just literally nothing. I sleep on the couch when you're not here. But uh, <laughs> jokes aside, uh, thank you for coming on today. Uh, I'm super happy to have you here, especially you know uh, your game is weird in like the cool way weird um because as i've said before language for all of its wonderful uses is imperfect mm -hmm. and especially communicating with people that don't speak your own language there's often uh a kind of a there's a very diff different languages have a tendency of looking at the world in very different ways and yeah. building a game around that is crazy. And I'm in, I, I would go even crazier. And if, even if you look at the same language used, so if you would speak to another English speaker, um, you're in agreement over what words mean, at least you think you are. So you have a vague notion of what dog means, for example, but dog is never, really attached to the entity that is a dog. It's something you, you, you think you know what dog means because um, you think you you figured it out as you grew up as a kid. Um, so even within the same language, uh, words can have different meanings. And it's all about the, the connection between humans in which language exists. Yeah. It's kind of this uh, agreed upon set of ideas meant exactly. to signify yeah. being. Yeah. Um, which is always one of those things where it's uh, one of the reasons why I always ask uh, guests from other countries, uh, because if you guys couldn't tell, he's Dutch. Yeah. Uh, you you are officially my second Dutch guest. Um, awesome. Yeah. The first was Rami. Right. That amazing bastard. No, <laughs> I love that guy. Uh, honestly, if it wasn't for kind of for him, I, I eloquence may have just completely not been on my radar prior to uh, the award show. Um, cool. But yeah, I mean, it's just he's like kind of like the OG raising uh, uh, awareness on other indie projects. Right. So um, we're following in your footsteps, buddy. Uh, <laughs> but, it, you know, so it's. Yeah, it, language is just this weird set of loosely agreed upon rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to to names, where it's you know you look at so many uh, words, and you know, like I can I can point to this this laptop on my desk, and you know, say laptop, and everybody knows what it is. But it, it, as you said, it doesn't denote an individual, whereas names are these effectively uh, meaningless words. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, Tom doesn't really have an intrinsic meaning. Uh, it is it is a name, it is a word that is literally meant to denote an individual, just as uh, 
I'm going to try and say this right. I, I'm not, I, I, bleh, I can't, it's, it's, it's not actually pronounced Gerben. It's, it's, it, it is Gerben. Yeah. But Gerben yeah. works just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I know. But it, you know, it's like, I feel bad when I imp- uh, pronounce people's names incorrectly because it's, yeah. I mean that, like that, that word is in a way it is you. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. feel, I feel marginally bad, <laughs> but I'm, it, I don't speak Dutch. <laughs> no, that's and you're forgiven. No one's perfect. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, even even names have you know they, they have an origin uh, somewhere which had meaning. Uh, so I'm not sure what what Tom uh, meant originally. Uh, Gerben is a Frisian name which contains the the uh, uh, the words of uh, Ger Gar, uh, which has Germanic roots in spear, and then Ben refers to bear. So it's like uh, as 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 brave or as dangerous as a as a bear armed with a spear. Well, I can't speak too much to uh, what Tom and Thomas means, but uh, with my family name Clancy, uh, going back through the uh, Celtic origins of it, and mm-hmm. it. Like the original Celtic version of it was like something like you know, like something stupid sounding. Like no offense to other people of Celtic descent, and definitely no offense to people who speak Gaelic. But like there are just some languages that sound kind of dumb. I'm looking at you, Welsh. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and it, it uh, Clancy, if memory serves, is the Red Warrior uh, in Gaelic, which. Mm-hmm. I don't know which part is red. I don't know which part is warrior. And like, I don't think that anybody who came up with that name back in the day would imagine that in the future that the most interesting people with that name would be known for uh, science, writing, and playing a robot on the internet. <laughs> so I'm sure somewhere in ancient ancestors all like, Look at these guys right here. Dude. What are you doing? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, and then, well, I mean, Thomas does, of course, also have the biblical nature of things, and I'm not going to get into mm. that. Right. I'll touch on, like, politics on this show any day of the week, but religion? <laughs> nope. No, sorry. Nope. Not touching that one. Steer clear. Pretty much, yeah. It's pretty wise, yeah. Yeah. So, um. In your own words, uh, or I guess kind of like uh, for the audience here, uh, what what is the elevator pitch for Eloquence? I think the elevator pitch is um, I'm, I'm the game drops you on an island. You don't speak the language of the people, <clears throat> but it will speak to you. So the idea is you walk up to an NPC and they will say something to you in the symbol language that you can that you can see in the speech bubble and you can grab any phrase that you find and drag it down to your inventory to store for later. And then you can walk up to other NPCs and give them back the phrases that people have been saying to you and uh, judge by their response uh, what, that sen- what that sentence means uh, and thus what those symbols might mean. So again, it's a game. We never tell you what the right answer is. Um, we want you to to craft your theories on what the symbols might mean, um, and through testing those theories and by discussing them with other players or with other people with you in the room, um, you begin to learn what the symbols mean and therefore begin to understand and read the language. Nice. That's definitely the kind of experimentation that you can't really see outside of the indie space. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, my, my original goal was um, I was hired to create a story for uh, another game and my client didn't want to use any language in that, uh, in that game <clears throat> because of localization costs. So I thought at first, would it be possible to to tell stories, to express yourself using only emojis, because emojis are universal. Uh, smileys, uh, we all we yeah. understand those. Then I found out that you actually need more information into a full emoji sentence uh, to convey a story. So that got me thinking and iterating, and then eventually this uh, the symbol system came out of it, and then I designed the rest of the game around that symbol language, because the, the client's game, um, it, 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 it 
fell through. So I was able to extract my symbols from from there and then build a new game around that that was just about facilitating you learning uh, the language as a player. Nice. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, definitely an interesting idea. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Arrival. I, uh, I am, yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, Great because, movie. Oh, yeah. Dude, Denis Villeneuve is a freaking cinema genius. <laughs> yeah. And because like dude has a level of patience in his storytelling mm. that is just Herculean. Um, but you know, we're not here to talk about Denis Villeneuve movies maybe later. No, but uh, we can but, talk about, about Amy Adams character a little bit. Yeah, I, I suppose. Exactly. Th there's a scene in which she writes on a, on a whiteboard. Um, what, what a, what a sentence is, what a phrase, what a, what a question is. So the, the goal for uh, the military organizations trying to communicate with these, these aliens that come to Earth is to ask them a question, why are you here? And she deconstructs the components that are present in that sentence um, and then gives her a little glimpse of a, of a, a code that linguists use to, um, uh, yeah, to decode phrases and to, uh, to make it Make it have sense for you as uh, whatever language you speak, and that's a little bit what eloquence does as well. So I, I look at the phrase that I want an NPC to speak, and then I code it in these symbols, which are actually quite linked to that linguist's code that I mentioned before. Um, so you're, I'm, I'm trying to train you to think like a linguist and to think about what language is, what components does it has. Uh, very simple words, just as I. And you, I mean, what does it mean? It, it has some kind of referential meaning attached to it. It's not about Gerben, it's not about Gerben. Um, it's about the people who's doing the talking in that phrase. So how, how do you show that in a symbol? Um, so it's, it's in addition to, well, we think it's fun to play. It's also very fun to work on because you get these questions that you need to solve. Um, so the, the game design itself becomes a puzzle in that sense. Nice. Yeah. Uh... Because it is, uh, you know, the idea of language as a mechanic is an exceedingly interesting one. Um, because it's, uh, languages too are reflections of the cultures that develop them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, uh, I think one of the interesting things going back to Arrival in this was that fake story she made up about what kangaroo means. Right. Because, uh, you know, we, we see a lot in sci-fi and television where, you know, people are meeting up for the first time and they speak different languages and they go like, Tom. And I'm just like, well, what are you? Know, she raises a very good point there. What are they signifying? Yeah. You know, to me, this is a reference to self, but to somebody else, I could be talking about the shirt I'm wearing. I could be talking about my torso, you know. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's no Rosetta Stone of of body language so to speak mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and you know it's a it, yeah it's just i could talk about like the theory of this for hours <laughs> um because i i don't know if i'm sure you've picked up on this at this point and i'm sure my audience has picked up <laughs> on this at by this point but i'm a nerd <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like this is just this is right in my wheelhouse yeah, that's um, awesome. Nerdy, nerdy nights. Yeah, I mean, because it's, it's, you know, like, it's, it's such an interesting take on puzzles because generally in games, they're spatial. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're moving an object. Like, I'm not, I can't move these objects, but it would be like, oh, like, clearly the, the coffee cup and the duck have to be moved. And then, you know, because yeah. they're, yeah. But it's, you know, this is a cultural puzzle. Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to keep it as culturally neutral as possible, uh, if that's even possible at all. And I'm discovering that as I go. Um, but yeah, like you said, a, a different pitch would be it's a point and click adventure game, uh, such as a classic Monkey Island game. Uh, but instead of picking up items and using items to clear the, the obstacles to uh, and to solve the puzzles, you collect the phrases and the symbols and uh, and those become your items, those become your tools to progress in, in the world. And that's also, I think, um, uh, what what distinguishes eloquence from, from other language and symbol language games is that um, the goal isn't to 
to understand the language. The goal isn't to decipher the symbols. The goal is to use the language to progress and to learn about the world and to learn about the people that inhabit the world. I imagine still there's going to be a subreddit uh, that's going to have the full breakdown of the language. Uh, kind I of hope like, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, are you familiar with Futurama? Futurama, yeah. Yeah, uh, kind of like how fans broke down the mutant language. Right. Yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah deciphered all of the signs. And I'm just like, I just, it, I just thought that those were just like silly symbols they drew up. But no, they made an actual language for, for the mutants. And I wish I remembered that last night for reasons that will become apparent later. <laughs> um, and, and what we've seen in testing, and I think it's very interesting, uh, especially when, when different language users um, talk about their experiences together, and sometimes they will have a different meaning attached to a particular symbol, uh, which still works within their own play session. So their interpretation is valid um, until they might, be, they, they might come at a point when it becomes invalid because it just doesn't match what's, what's visible on, on the screen. But um, within their own uh, experience, They've, they've cracked the symbol for themselves. It's only by talking about them with other people that they might see some differences and uh, discover that might, it might be a different meaning after all. Yeah. It's uh, also to tie that just like directly back into video games, uh, the difference between the kind of Western understanding of the symbols on a PlayStation controller versus the Japanese hmm. understanding where it's like we see the the X or as they call it the cross and for us that's a symbol of choice of of selection but for them it's a, a symbol of cancellation hmm. and so it's you know so for uh the western defaults uh X button becomes the selection button but because it's uh a and you know a deselection uh, uh, an exclusion symbol it's the symbol for them to move backwards in menus i didn't know that that's very interesting yeah i it was something i picked up uh when i was working at uh midway games years I... ago now jeez that's <laughs> been almost it'll be 12 years next month wow yeah uh it was my first game job i was doing testing for mortal Kombat versus dc universe oh cool so um Sorry, my wife has made coffee. I can smell it. <laughs> I I also uh, I, I also work at a, a Starbucks here, so or in Milwaukee <laughs> is like my air quotes day job. So I am very keenly uh, attuned to the smell of coffee. Right. Um, especially what is she making? It's a great smell. Yeah. It is. I'm. I'm uh, that's that is one of our Asian coffees. Ah, uh, my wife likes darker roast coffees, so mm -hmm. I know when she's made coffee. I prefer lighter and medium roasts because, like, I, I I don't like dark roast coffee. To me, is is burnt. You mm -hmm. know, I like I like a lighter, especially like uh, uh, I love uh, East African coffees like Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, Rwanda. Oh God, Rwandan <laughs> coffee is so good. But I just, I love the acidity that's imparted to the coffee through, you know, another show, another show. <laughs> um, okay, I, I love coffee. I'm not very picky about my coffee, though. I, I will drink anything that's black and hot. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm still in student mode, I guess. Just I've, caffeine. I've caffeine become working. picky about it, uh, not because I work at Starbucks, but as a result of working there. Mm -hmm. Um you know, like, I'm not going to say that I think Starbucks has the best coffee in the world because they don't. Um, there are so many better coffee shops everywhere. Uh, but it's it, it because I, I took uh, the path to become an air quotes coffee master. Um, mm -hmm. I have just developed my my language of coffee. And cool. so I've just, you know, because I mean, food is a language, drink is a, a language, you know, uh, it, it's the way it is enjoyed is cultural. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I should make a coffee game. No. Um, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't transmit taste through a game. Not yet. I yeah, mean, but I'm not. Keep your mind open. I'm not inventing that technology, okay? I, I have a hard enough time 
getting this going. Like I, I got Vive trackers so I can get my arms <laughs> in and I sat down and worked on it for like a half hour yesterday, got nowhere. And I was like, I quit, but I have another angle of attack, which I will, uh, which I'll do this afternoon. But, um, you mentioned play testing a little bit and to get back <laughs> to why we're actually supposed to be here. Um, and uh, I went back through your uh, through the tweets on the Eloquence account mm. um, because, you know, due diligence, I, I want to have good questions for you. Um, and you took the game to EGX last year. Correct. And uh, I think one of my favorite tweets, and I wish I could pull it up for you right now, but I'm not quite that prepared, um, was uh, a tweet that you sent out on the last day of the show and people were still lining up to test the game like that speaks well, that speaks quite well but there, there's no beating around the bush here like that speaks very well of your game but um what kind of in like how has the input from uh shows like egx and other play testing helped uh to push along and develop uh your design process um it tells me a lot about how people interact with the game world and with the symbols themselves and um I mean, I have a small team that I, uh, I work together with, but in the end, it's still, you know, my, my vision and my idea of, of the symbols and uh, uh, what I think they ought to mean. Uh, and until I release that into some kind of chaotic environment, I'm not sure if that matches with what, what other people think the symbols mean. So yeah, it's, it's crucial to, to test the game, to test prototypes and uh, see if my vision corresponds with how other people interpret the puzzles, etc. Um, and then I can I can tweak and make sure that the user experience is is optimal, and that the uh, the, the the learning curve isn't too steep, um, <clears throat> or or too easy, because then you you wouldn't have a puzzle game. You would just go through the motions, and uh, that also wouldn't be satisfying. So uh, yeah, going to the to these events is very important to um, to me and for the project, because uh, otherwise I would just wouldn't get the input. Uh, it would it would be you know, my ideal puzzle world. Uh, and I think especially, so as you progress in the game, you get more and more options. Uh, you get to break open the sentences, you get to recombine the symbols and, and um, create your own input basically. So especially in that phase, it's very important to know what kind of direction players are uh, taking, taking uh, what kind of direction their, their thought process is taking. Um, uh, cause that helps me set up a good puzzle with the right red herrings and the right carrots on the stick, um, to keep them going, to keep it enjoyable. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. I think of what it helps for, for, for my project is I have uh, this fantastic artist on board and the art that he makes just draws in the people, uh, from a distance. And then once they sit down and they get a feeling for the puzzles, then they, that, that becomes their, um, uh, the puzzles become uh, start to 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 grab them, uh, and keep them seated and keep them playing. And usually, when people are done, they will ask, "Is there are there more levels to solve? Is there more that I can uh, that I can do?" Um, and I think that's that's the best sign you can have uh, at an event like that. No, the art is beautiful. I actually because you have so many screenshots up on the Twitter account, mm. and because the style is this very painterly look. Yeah. Um, I was concerned that they were just uh, concept art and right. then like actually full screening the videos you have available. And that is actually just the look of the game. Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah, it's very pretty. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're using 2D art and uh, framed animation uh, to give it a, uh, I think it, it, generally I'm, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from uh, the secret of monkey Island. Uh, just in, in what kind of emotion it sh should be emotional, especially because people won't be able to understand what the, what the characters are saying uh, initially, at least. So you need to have some kind of visual guidance to to show what areas are safe. It's also why we've chosen to make it a very colorful environment. It shouldn't be too too gloomy, too moody, because that might make people think they're in danger and we want people to take the time to think about the language so that's what i meant when when i said everything is designed around solving the the language and about using the language um it's meant to to create an environment for you that you feel happy in and um you you feel like you're at least safe to experiment a little bit 
before people start poking you with uh, with pointy sticks. God, can you imagine this game or your game set in like Victorian England with all of like the fog and just everything? <laughs> that would yeah. just be terrible. <laughs> Like, I mean, it, it it would very clearly, like, I'm, now I just, I want you to make the horror spinoff set in Victorian <laughs> England. So uh, that's that's your free idea for me. All Thank future you. ideas will cost money. Um, <laughs> I expect a producer credit. Uh, but, I mean, you know, and yeah, by creating something that I'll switch over to another, uh, to a screenshot real quick. Um you know, creating something, you know, this one in particular is a beach scene. And yeah, there's, there's, you know, like the warthog over there on the side of the screen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you're very clearly kind of pointing out visually. that's like, oh, cool. This is out in the periphery. It's in a shadow. This is something that we probably shouldn't be looking at. You know, you have mm -hmm. uh, the guard with a spear and a shield. Like clearly this dude is uh not necessarily going to be somebody you initially want to talk to but then you have you know what looks like a fruit vendor over there and that is bright and inviting yeah you know and yeah. it's you know like very clearly you you have effectively hacked the visual language of humanity <laughs> to yeah, all, all credit goes to my artist for that one his name is Samuel van Klaabergen. um He's uh, and th that's also his, his his forte. He thinks about how to visually guide people over uh, an image like that. And the one you're showing that's from an older prototype. So we're still trying to figure out how to set up the levels and what kind of obstacles uh, would work and and wouldn't work. But um, uh, that's exactly the idea. So the guard is clearly some kind of obstacle. You, you want to make sure that you don't, uh, you know, you don't make them angry. Um, and then your your eyes are guided to someone else standing nearby, and they might have something to say about that, that could help you um, if you can figure out what it is they're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely like I can't like I'm very much looking forward to seeing like getting a chance to sit down and play it and see it in action, and you know just try and you know get the gears going for it but <laughs> well i mean it's just it's, you know, puzzle games are those they're uh for lack of a better word they're like the the like james joyce novels of video games <laughs> you know these these you know these games that really make you think and work mm -hmm those portions of your brain and i mean you know like the uh, doom 2016 and doom eternal kind of do it just with blood and gore but you know it's it's like games like portal and uh, mm -hmm. uh anything that jonathan blow makes like you make it through those games and you feel like you've actually done something yeah you know and it's uh you you feel like you've gotten maybe even a little bit smarter um which uh, maybe I should go play Portal 2 again. But no, uh, <laughs> whenever you're having a problem in life and you can't feel that you're not smart enough to solve it, go play some Portal. Portal um, 2, yeah. Yeah, Portal 2. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's just, these are the kinds of experiences that I, I find myself coming back to in games too. You know, like, don't get me wrong. Like I love to go back and replay like Halo or Mass Effect or something like that mm -hmm. because they're excellent experiences. But you know, even knowing the solutions to puzzles, sometimes it's still fun to go back and look at how it's all put with that foreknowledge and getting to kind of logic out how it's all put together. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think in addition to uh so it's so all something that something that we discovered is that it becomes kind of like a social process uh, so by talking to other players or talking to the, the person sitting next to you about a puzzle um you learn about one another and the way you think and uh the assumptions you make as a player uh so it also becomes uh becomes a way to strengthen your relationship um one of my favorite parts of egx was that there were quite a lot of kids there um and they, of course, they were attracted to the, the prototype, the demo uh, for the art. And so then you know, their, their father, usually their father was with them. Uh, sometimes their, their mother would sit with them and they would try to solve the, the puzzles together. And um, more often than not, the, the kid would guess the right answer. 
uh, they would fill in the blanks and, and they would they would you know make a make an assumption and uh, uh, blurt out the right answer for uh, for a puzzle and then the father would go hmm, no don't think that's it don't think that's it so if you if you enhance that a little bit more and uh, then it becomes a dialogue between a child and their parents about what language is and how you use language and how you can use language to get what you want for example um, and I think that's uh, s slowing down gameplay and allowing for the kind of contemplation. I think it's very, very valuable um, as a social effect in uh, in playing game. And, and I think puzzle games are most likely uh, to fit in that that model. Man, uh, you, you touched on something I talked about uh, yesterday as well on the show. Uh, people have a really bad preconception that kids are dumb. <laughs> yeah. And like, I'm not saying that kids aren't dumb by adult standards, mm -hmm. but kids have a tendency to be highly adaptable, see solutions that nobody else is going to see and have a fearlessness in trying out those solutions that we as adults tend to shy away from. Yeah. For, you know, for fear of being wrong or whatever. But, like, uh, kids just just see connections that nobody else sees. You yeah. Know, and, it's... And, and I think they're less afraid to fail as well. So just experiment, play. You know, just play, see what happens. And, um, yeah, if it works, then you've done something. If it doesn't work, you've done something else. But you've always learned something, at least. And... Um, I think that's what I like about games as well, especially games that give you some kind of freedom to to explore uh, and just see what happens. Um, and it's kind of kind of weird that we encourage children to learn through playing, uh, but once you get in school and you know higher education, it just becomes about reproducing um, the stuff that other people already know, and and failure becomes something to to feel ashamed uh, about. Yeah. Uh, anybody who's watching with kids out there, listen to this dude. He kind of knows what's up. That's it. <laughs> I don't have kids, so I have no idea. Okay. Um, I, I have two kids, so uh, I you mentioned know a little bit about Yeah, you'd mentioned having kids in our emails back and forth and uh, uh, getting the show set up. So are you, you know, like not using them, but uh, are they a tool in your playtesting uh, toolbox? Uh, well, they're, they're quite young. Um, I showed them a, you know, the latest prototype a little while ago and it just didn't like the, some of the animations. So they thought that the character was stupid. Um, my eldest just turned four last week. Uh, so, but it would be interesting to, uh, I'm actually very interested in, in how she deals with, uh, uh, with the symbols. Um, also because we raised her, uh, bilingually, so she speaks Chinese as well as Dutch. Uh, picking up a little bit of English along the way, <clears throat> and she she can switch between Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, and uh, and Dutch effortlessly. So mid sentence even. So her Dang, her man. her brain is already uh, wired differently than than well than mine. I was raised up sort of like bilingually. I, I speak a dialect, um, but she she can wield these two very different language uh, systems uh, very easily. So I, I would be very interested in seeing how she deals with those uh, with those symbols. Yeah. Your daughter's making us look bad over here in the U.S. Uh, <laughs> um, you speak no other language? Just uh, je parle un petit peu de français. Ah, très bien. Um, so, yeah, I, I sadly, I used to be fluent, but then I didn't use it for, oh, yeah. well over a decade. And I lost most of it, but you know, at least I can say more than the American, you know, like "oué la salle de bain," <laughs> you know. Um, and I learned from a, a French French speaker, so I don't sound Canadian. Uh, yeah. Which nothing wrong with sounding Canadian, but you don't want to sound French Canadian in France. It's and different, you, yeah. Yeah, you also don't want to sound French in French Canada, Canada. <laughs> uh, but I don't care. So I'll sound French wherever I want to go, uh, yeah. which for being an American, that's pretty good. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. And I mean, I, I was quite obsessed with my accent uh, until a couple of years ago. 
uh, and then I just, you know, realized this is part of who I am. It's part of my background. So I could, you know, take some courses and try to speak perfectly American or perfectly British English. But um, then again, I, I have nothing to hide about where I came from. Um, it's, so, um, it, yeah. it's really funny to an extent, too, uh, on that, because you'll see uh, actors uh, and actresses when they're, er, who are from elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, when they are on talk shows uh, or something in, you know, not America, talking mm -hmm. in their usual accent. So, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people don't understand that Gillian Anderson from The X-Files spent a lot of time growing up in the UK. So she mm -hmm. has an English accent. Yeah. Um, or people who are big fans of the television show The Wire don't er, and aren't aware that Idris Elba is actually English. Right. Yeah. You know, and so when they'll come over and they'll be on, you know, like Letterman or not Letterman because he's not on TV anymore, but like Colbert or, or Jimmy Fallon or something. And they'll they'll emulate the accent that we know them for. But then you watch them on, you know, Graham Norton or previously like Top Gear or something. Yeah. And it's just if you're not ready for it, like I didn't know David <laughs> Tennant was like hardcore Scottish. Oh, yeah. Or, or uh, McAvoy either. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I was all like, man, I wish they <laughs> talked like that over here because I'm one of the few people that can translate that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah. it is weird, man. Like, come on, guys. No, oh, it's like, let me, let me take a moment here and talk to my American audience here. Guys, learn another language. <laughs> it's cool. Trust me. It's fun. I, it's a perfect time right now, too, because we're not allowed through the rest of the world. So let's take this time, <laughs> learn another language. And so when we go out there, we're going to surprise the crap out of them because we used our quarantine time productively. All right, back to the show. Um, I'm sure it's that... Good message. Yeah, it is a good message, but I'm yeah. sure that somebody's going to be like, oh, Tom, stop, you know, get off your soapbox, stop telling <laughs> me to speak France talk, you know, Um and honestly, if you're worried about learning a language that's like real, that's if you want to learn something closer to English, pick up like German. You know, we're yeah. technically a Germanic language. You know, yeah. Although I did spend a little bit of time in Germany, and by a little bit, I mean I was there for like a week. But okay, understanding enough of how like English words are put together, I could sit down and look at like a German menu mm -hmm. and figure it out. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it becomes fun once you begin to see, you know, through the code. Yeah. Uh, see through the matrix and uh, begin to see the, the patterns and uh, similarities. Yeah. My wife does that with way too many languages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She learned German in high school. She mm -hmm. picked up Danish while she lived there doing uh, like six, seven months abroad in college. Uh, she understands and can read Dutch. Well she can understand Norwegian and Swedish and cool. she can pick up enough in Russian. Oh, wow. Yeah. But you ask her to pick up any of the, the, the romance languages. Romantic, yeah. No clue. <laughs> um, so, but it, well, some clue, but not much clue. Uh, yeah, I, th I think over here in the Netherlands, we're quite lucky that we live in those crossroads of, of, of languages. So we have Germans to the east and Engl English uh, to the west, to the France, you have, uh, to the south, you have France. And up north, you have the Scandinavian languages, which are already quite similar to ours and to, uh, to Germans. But it creates a healthy dose of, uh, of a mix uh, in, in, in uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, Cultural exchange and linguistic yeah. Ex exchange, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in historically, your country has always kind of like uh, 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 hit out, uh, has always uh, carried yourself out of your weight class, uh, given the size of your country <laughs> relative <laughs> yeah, to everyone else. I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, hey, you, you did we good for traders, yourselves. Yeah. yeah, you did we, good we for traders, yourselves. So, yeah, we, we had nothing, so we had to bring it in from somewhere else and we found out that other people were willing to pay more for the stuff we brought in so uh i mean yeah, and then then language becomes the, the bridge uh you want to make sure that you understand one another and you uh, also have some yeah. damn fine artists in your stable 
uh, and uh, uh, definitely engineers because you managed to hold the sea at bay for hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. Might not have been the wisest strategy, but you pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, for the time being, we still have dry feet, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, you know, this is the fun kind of international discourse you can have where you have jokes about the strengths of each other. You know, like we're really good at being loud. <laughs> You'll always be able to find the American in the crowd. Um, ooh, no, not unless there's an Australian. They're also loud. <laughs> but they're all right. They're all right. They have to yeah. be loud because there's all the dangerous animals. They need to, to, to let them know a human is coming. Yeah, and to commu communicate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fictional cat, nice of you to join us. Good to see you. Um, but uh, really, the only uh, the last question I have uh, prepared for all this um, is: uh, Have you like has anything cool happened since the Pig Awards or the Pitcher Game Awards? I'm trying to train myself not to say Pig because like <laughs> I don't like Liam. If you're creeping in chat, we need to figure something else out because pig does not have any positive connotations um <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah i'm well i imagine hopeful i'd like to think that you've gotten a lot more eyes on your game and hopefully some oh, good yeah, definitely. quality eyes on the game yeah 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 um it it, it 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 coincided with uh a couple of other um events that we attended so we've been talking to a lot of investors and publishers recently and we're trying to uh you know, to get the funding together to make the rest of the game. So in that sense, yeah, the the, uh, the picture game awards uh, were very helpful to show that, you know, people, we now have proof that people uh, like the appeal of the game and uh, uh, they, they, they see what, some kind of value in there. Because one of the, the problems that, um, well, that I feel I'm facing is that it, it, it seems quite niche and I don't really want it to be that niche. Um, you mentioned Jonathan Blow before. I, I think the game is quite similar to uh, The Witness in a sense that it, there's an internal language uh, that is being taught to you by the game itself as you progress in, in the game. So there's no other dialogue in there other than the, the puzzles that you're faced with. And that's just, you need to make do with, uh, with that. Um, so, but, but it seems like it's very, it's very hardcore, um, very niche. So in that sense, being part of this uh, of the, the picture game awards really helps uh, uh, prove that you know normal people also like the game. Nice. I'm allegedly normal people now. Yes, <laughs> I'll take applied, that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Um, well, uh, I guess the last thing now would be the five questions. So, in case you're unaware and anyone in the audience is unaware. The five questions is a series of, well, five questions that I have prepared before the show uh, that have pretty much nothing to do with anything we've talked about previously. Uh, that said, I've, I've been on a kick of theming the questions lately, uh, and your theme oh boy. is fictional languages. Aha. So... Uh, every question on this list is going to have to do with a particular fictional language. Uh, oh, crap. And now uh, I have to dab. Dab. And uh, technically you do as well. I, I dab. Yeah, you got to you gotta do Let me get the proper camera angle here. All right, cool. Yeah, if you could. All right, there we go. Now that the dabs are out of the way, fictional cat makes us do that all the time. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm beginning to re regret making that a channel point reward. Uh, so, fictional languages. Every question is going to be about a fictional language. Ish. So, question number one. In 2010, a local theater company in Chicago performed Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol in which fictional language? 2010. This is a fun fact, though, that has that's not going to give you a uh, uh, yeah a, a leg I'm, up I'm, on this. 
I'm fanatic. I'm very fanatical about these things. So uh, now it's gonna gonna be a guess. Uh, Klingon. That would be correct. Cool. So in the fun, here's the fun tidbit. Uh, I lived on the same block as that theater oh, when wow. they were doing that. Um, didn't go because ah. I should have. I absolutely should have because Klingon is like one of my personal favorite fictional languages. Um, Do you understand a bit of Klingon? Uh, no, but. Okay. I found this out last night while I was uh, researching these questions. You, there is a beta of Klingon on Duolingo. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and I think I know what language I'm going to be learning during this <laughs> quarantine. Yeah. For you when know. you visit Klingon after the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I mean, this way I'll be able to watch all the Star Trek and know exactly what they're saying without <laughs> yeah. having, because like there are scenes in Klingon where they don't have subtitles. I want to know what they're saying. Yeah. My stomach yeah. hurts. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're saying something <laughs> a little bit more of consequence than that. But I mean, the amount of gach that they eat, I wouldn't be surprised. So, um, question number two, uh, in the movie Star Wars, everybody speaks galactic basic. Uh, mostly everybody speaks galactic basic. What is the name of the alphabet for that language? Oh boy. Yeah, no idea. I don't know. Uh, the answer to that is Orobesh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, if my friend Dan Amrick is watching, he probably isn't, but, uh, he's a big fan of Orobesh and, uh, he even has Orobesh keycaps for his keyboard. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. He's a bit of a nerd. <laughs> All right. Uh, question number three. What is the language spoken by the horse lords of the Great Grass Sea? The horse lords of the what? The Great Grass Sea. The Great Grass Sea. That's Dothraki. That is. I, I, I was very specific in how I uh, uh, worded that question because I wanted yeah. to give you a good chance. Because, I mean, it's like, dude, I'm looking over all this stuff and I'm like, who actually knows this? <laughs> you know, and I mean, me, but because uh, <laughs> honestly, with the exception of que the question coming up, I, I, I knew the answers to all of these and not because I researched them, but because I knew them. Um, yeah, cool. Uh so question number four, uh, how many main branches are there in Tolkien's Elvish? Main branches? Well, there's Kenya and there's Sindarin. Uh, oh, and there's uh, a, and a bonus point for the total number of, uh, we're going to say current branches to uh, the end of the Third Age uh, in the events of the Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I read Tolkien. I'm not sure if you include the languages of the, the Teleri and, uh, and the Sylvans, for example. Um, so, I've, to be honest, I've never been that fond of the Elvish language. I, I've always been more interested in the, in the Dwarven language, in Husdul. Uh, so, um, if you take into account languages of elves that didn't go to the sea, then my my guesstimate would be a three. Um, you are correct, and you're getting a bonus point because you named at, you named one of the other two uh, uh, less main branches. So I forget what all five of them are, but but yeah. <laughs> Uh, there yeah. are the, so there are the three main branches, and then there are two like sub branches in mm -hmm. that are relevant during the time of the War of the Ring, uh, and yeah, so yes, you you have uh, you have made up for not knowing about Orabesh. Um, final question, my personal favorite question. It's a true or false question. Only Nixon could go to China. True or false? is an ancient Vulcan proverb. Well, that has to be true. And it is. It's a quote from Star Trek VI. 
Wow. <laughs> um, that was the only question I didn't absolutely have to research uh, to do. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, in the opening of Star Trek VI, uh, the Klingon homeworld of Kronos has, uh, or not the Klingon homeworld, but a moon of uh, Kronos, Praxis, has exploded. And mm -hmm. uh, they have tasked uh, Captain Kirk with being part of the ambassador team to meet with the Klingon High Chancellor. Uh, and of course, afterwards, he's completely upset because Kirk, Klingons, you know, they've got mm -hmm. some bad blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Spock just goes, you know, uh, we have an ancient, we have an old Vulcan proverb: only Nixon could go to China. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, I believe that they were listening to humans <laughs> when Nixon went to China. Of course, I have a feeling we're going to have a new American proverb, which is only Trump could go to North Korea. Uh, yeah. Ugh. I'd rather not think that that happened, but it did. It did. It was a show. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to do it until I did it. And I was just, uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes I'm so disappointed. But, Gerben, thank you so much for being here. Uh, My you, absolute pleasure. You get an asterisk on your your score of five because it was through bonus points, but you still get a score of five, which uh, ties you for the top performing person to answer the five questions. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah the the winner was what is it? That was I think it was Rob Madden earlier this week mm -hmm. from Cloud Jumper, and uh, dude knows his clouds. <laughs> Like, I, I was just like, oh, Gotta, dude. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the guy's making a game about flying like a tugboat in the sky. And I'm just yeah. like, oh, yeah, this guy doesn't know anything about clouds. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Dude knows his clouds. He's Scottish, right? I mean, they have lots of yeah. clouds in, in Scotland. Well, I mean, they got lots of clouds everywhere. But like <laughs> my time in Scotland, they all looked relatively the same. They either had rain or they didn't. <laughs> Yeah, it might be the same as the Eskimo myth. And then 40 words for snow. That's actually not a myth. It's not a myth? No, it's not. Because I, I, I went to Alaska in 2011 um, okay. with my wife and my uh, mom and my stepdad. And we were up there. And, like, they don't have as many as, like, so it it's an over-exaggeration. Yeah, okay. So that's but it's, I well, I mean, the Greek language has three words for time. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's... It, it's it's not that they you know there's three you know different times it's it's they have different contexts for it yeah so it's it's a matter of you know so it's it's you know a specialty of context yeah exactly yeah and, you know, and like, those are going to be very interesting symbols for me to design <laughs> oh so are you confirming that there's snow on your island uh that's not confirmed well i can <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I got him. I got him, guys. No, but thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I know with the time and stuff, like chat wasn't as active as it could have been. It's okay, guys. I don't blame you. But I'm still super glad to have had you here, and I've had a lot of fun talking with you. Yeah, me too. And I, I learned stuff, so that's uh, that's always good. Dude, I got to learn some stuff, and like you know. I never get to nerd out on like Denis Villeneuve movies. <laughs> so like having that opportunity was just like amazing. Yeah. Um, cool. Dude, are you looking forward to his uh, Dune movie that's coming out? I'm very curious about it. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to oh, yeah. make a movie out of that. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Well, uh, this is going to uh, people hate this opinion of mine, but I do not like the original Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. at all okay um i acknowledge that it's important and portions of it are very good but denis villeneuve's blade runner 2049 is fantastic <laughs> and if he can make blade runner good <laughs> he's gonna nail dune it's a good chance of dune yeah yeah because uh, another unpopular opinion i hate dune <laughs> like the book it is right. amazing it is so good but i hate it <laughs> like sad as that is 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm super looking forward to that movie. But before we yeah. go, uh, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so you can find more about the game at uh, at Game Eloquence on Twitter. Uh, we recently put up a Facebook page, but uh, just you know, look for Eloquence, and you should be able to find it. Um, but mostly over Twitter, and then we have a newsletter that you can sign up for at uh, Game Eloquence. Sorry, eloquencegame.com. It's not confusing at all. Not at all. Um, not at all. Uh, and we try to do updates, but I'm. Um, got to be honest i'm pretty bad with updates so um i'm doing i'm doing the best i can uh but be uh be gentle with me yeah i'll do my best but <laughs> i can't vouch for those guys uh that said though if i ever hear about anyone in my studio audience being a jerk to somebody on the internet or dogpiling on someone you're out that's not my community we are a community of positivity so yeah. I'm just saying that now. I'm making it clear right away. Uh, <laughs> but, well, it's been amazing having you here. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Like, no joke, stay in touch. I care about this game. Um, cool. we Will do. And especially, like, as you get closer to release and all that stuff, I'd love to have you back on. Um, oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, help promote the release. Like, come on, man. Like, I mean, I, I said this profusely yesterday but uh you know the part of this show is helping to celebrate and bring other people's projects to light and like dude you're mm -hmm. making a game using language as a puzzle like hell yeah i'm helping you boost that <laughs> you know? that's cool i appreciate that yeah yeah so uh now is the time where i cut to another one of my wonderful angles i do say thank you again and i'll talk to you again in just a moment um sure. But for everybody back home who's watching the show, thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we will, the duck here still needs a name. So we're going to hold, uh, keep the nominations open until 6 p.m. Eastern time tonight. You can send them to me directly on Twitter at Tom Clancy. Remember the H, it's important. Uh, and at 6 p.m., I will throw up a Twitter or a poll of some sort. I don't know, Twitter poll, uh, straw poll, whatever. That will run for 24 hours. And uh, when the uh, voting is complete, we will announce the name of the duck at the show tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, where I sit down with Fernando Mello of Game Director Story. And on Sunday, we're doing community game night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, go ahead and hit me up on Twitter if you want to take part in that. We're going to be playing Unfortunate Spacemen on Steam. It's free to play. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you buy a game. Uh, hidden Roll game looks really fun. I'm looking forward to trying it. Uh, but that's pretty much it for today. Thank you all for joining us, and I will see you all on the next episode of That Tom Clancy Show. Good night or morning time. I'm just going to go.